Today we're gonna to take a look at the medication Retitrutide, and we're gonna break this video up into three parts. Part one is gonna be how this medication actually works to facilitate weight loss. Part two is gonna be the research surrounding this medication. I'm filming this video February of 2025, so things could change several years later if you're watching this in the future. And then part three is gonna be best practices, namely what people are doing right now to maximize the pros and minimize the potential cons. But before we get into that, quick disclaimer, this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. This should not be used to treat, diagnose, or stand in the place of any medical advice from a qualified medical professional. So let's get into part one, how Retitrutide actually works to help you lose weight. In order for you to understand Retitrutide, you gotta understand a couple of different things. GLP-1, GCG, GIP. So GLP-1, glucose-like peptide one. When you activate this receptor, What's gonna happen is you're gonna have a couple of different things. The first thing is it's gonna slow down intestinal motility. So when you eat something, it's gonna take longer for it to be excreted. You're gonna feel fuller longer, and as a result, you're going to eat less. If you can do that enough, and you can be in a calorie deficit, you can lose weight. Secondly, it acts on the pancreas to have kind of a smooth release of insulin. And GLP-1 receptor agonists were originally developed for diabetics, so they could basically have a release of insulin with a low chance of a hypoglycemic effect, namely when your blood sugar goes way too low. And then lastly, and this is very preliminary, it could act on your brain to kind of quiet the habit centers. So again, this is very preliminary, but some research suggests that people who are suffering from substance abuse disorder may benefit from GLP-1 RAs. So some of the medications that you may have heard of that are strictly GLP-1 RAs would be semaglutide or Ozempic, I guess is the brand name. Now let's talk about GIP. So GIP stands for glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. So GIP, when you activate that in addition to GLP-1, seems to contribute more to burning more energy. So now you have the GLP-1, which is causing you to eat less, and you have the activation of GIP, which is causing you to burn more, and you should expect to see more robust weight loss, and that's what we do see. So when you compare medications like terzepatide to semaglutide, terzepatide is a GLP-1 plus GIP receptor agonist, you see a more robust weight loss from that. Now GCG, so glucagon itself. Retitrutide activates GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon. Okay, so when you agonize that receptor, that can contribute to lipolysis. So basically your body's ability to break down fat and use it as energy. So think about, you now have the perfect storm. You're eating less from GLP-1 receptor agonizing. You are burning more from GIP-1. And now you are preferentially or more preferentially drawing from body fat to use as energy. So retitrutide, in theory, you should expect it to have the most robust weight loss because you're having all of these things helping you. So what do we see? We're gonna get into that in part two, the research surrounding retitrutide. So first you need to understand the three phases of clinical trials. So phase one, shorter term, smaller population, you're looking for immediate side effects. Phase two, longer term, more people, you can compare it to other medications. And then phase three, much more people, usually multiple years, and you can see if there's any long-term side effects and long-term effects of this medication. So as of right now, February of 2025, it is finished with phase two clinical trials. It's currently in phase three. So we have some good research, but some of this stuff could change. But since it's in phase two, we can still get it compounded. First study we're gonna look at is in the New England Journal of Medicine. Studies titled Triple Hormone Receptor Agonist Retitrutide for Obesity, a Phase Two Trial. So I read this whole thing, I looked at the protocols, I looked at the actual research summary, I tried to pull out some of the salient points that you might find interesting. So the first thing that I found interesting was that they actually had people exercise. So the placebo group, as well as the retitrutide group, were exercising the entire time. And I saw this in the, in the protocol section. It was in 5.3.1, diet and physical activity counseling. Study participants will receive diet and physical activity counseling using a standardized approach by a dietitian or nutritionist. Was it great advice? I don't know, I haven't seen it, but I thought that was interesting that the placebo group was exercising. When you look at the actual results, you can see that. So looking at the research summary, you can actually look at a chart and you can see the different doses, the 24 week mark and the 48 week mark. And what you see is the placebo group with diet and exercise did lose some weight. After 48 weeks, they lost 2.1% on average. Then it goes obviously a lot more than that. So the one milligram group 
after 48 weeks, lost 8.7%, and it just goes down the list. So the group that had the most robust weight loss was the people who got up to the maximum dose in this study, which was 12 milligrams. Additionally, if you look at the adverse events, the same thing. You see that the more medication the person was taking, the more side effects they had, especially nausea. That's pretty much a straight line up if you look at it. The placebo group also had nausea, <laughs> but it's not from reditrutide. So there is definitely an increase in things like nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation as you took more of this medication. So I found that interesting. Another thing is to actually dig into the protocols that they used. I found this in the protocols section. It was like 400 pages, took a while to find. So you look at the schema here, you can see that the 12 milligram group didn't just start at 12 milligrams. So they did two milligrams for four weeks, four milligrams for four weeks, eight milligrams, and then they went up to 12. So it actually took them a couple of months to get to the 12 milligram. They've had other groups that just started straight on four milligrams, some groups that started just straight on one milligram. So they're still trying to figure out the actual dosing for this medication, at least right now in the phase two clinical trials. We have some interesting evidence to basically go off of not only this, but what real world people are doing. We'll get into that in part three. This is the first study we're going to look at. Next study we're going to look at has to do with what used to be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Let's get into that. The next study we're going to look at is actually a sub-study of the first one. And the reason this is relevant has to do with understanding visceral fat. So when you're obese, you have the subcutaneous kind of jiggly stuff on the outside but you may also have a lot of visceral fat, and that's the fat surrounding your organs. It'll surround your kidneys, your liver, your intestines, and this contributes a lot to inflammation and can contribute to things like heart disease, maybe even certain cancers, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this study, the researchers, this is Nature Medicine, they pulled out the relevant information to show how retitrutide impact non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the study is titled, Triple hormone receptor agonist retitrutide for metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, a randomized phase 2A trial. This is straight from the abstract. The mean relative change from baseline in liver fat at 24 weeks was negative 42.9% at 1 milligram, negative 57% at 4 milligram, negative 81.4% at 8 milligrams, negative 82.4% at 12 milligrams. And the placebo actually gained a little bit of liver fat. At 24 weeks, normal liver fat levels was achieved by 27% of people at the 1 milligram, 52% of the people at 4 milligrams, 79% of the people at 8 milligrams, and 86% of the people at 12 milligrams, and the placebo did not see alleviation of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Liver fat reductions were significantly related to changes in body weight, abdominal fat, and metabolic measures associated with improved insulin sensitivity and lipid metabolism. So this medication, yes, it'll help you lose weight and look better, that's what we all want, but it also may contribute to, at least in this study, the loss of a lot of visceral fat and contribute to long-term health. So now, that was a sub-study. Let's look at how retitrutide impacts people that these classes of medication were originally developed for, diabetics. So let's get into that next. The last study I'm gonna look at is a great phase two clinical trial. It's comparing retitrutide with an existing medication on the market, dulaglutide. And it's also controlling it with placebo. So it's double blind, it's a great study. And more or less what they did is they tried different doses of retitrutide against dulaglutide in the placebo to see how it controlled hemoglobin A1C, which is a really good way to test for the severity of diabetes. This is the interpretation of the study. In people with type 2 diabetes, retitrutide showed clinically meaningful improvements in glycemic control and robust reductions in body weight with a safety profile consistent with GLP-1 receptor agonists and GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonists. These phase 2 data also informed dose selection for the phase 3 program. So this is the main reason this classification of drug was originally developed, it was for people with diabetes, and it does seem to be efficacious in that sense. So now we have a good, well-rounded base of research. We understand how it interacts with obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and now diabetes. So now we know how it works. We have the studies to show that it does work. Let's get into part three, best practices for using retitrutide. When we're talking about best practices here, I'm gonna use the 
best information that's available to us. Again, it's only through phase two clinical trials. I'm gonna use user experience of people who have used this medication, as well as some of the experience we have with other GLP-1, GIP receptor agonists. We are now offering this medication to Steel Health and Hormone Center. This is the protocol that we're going to follow. Number one, start low and go slow. So user experience, a lot of people will start at one or two milligrams, so not four, not eight, and they'll go up by one or two milligrams every four weeks to tolerance. So some people will stay very low, some people titrate up, but it's always best to start low and to go slow. And that's what we're gonna do at Steel Health and Hormone Center. That way your body can kind of get used to the medication a little bit, and if there's any side effects, it's easy to pull back. You don't wanna start at a maximum dose because you could be in for a wild ride. Secondly, you wanna go through a reputable compounding pharmacy. It's crazy to me how many people to save 50 bucks will go and buy this stuff on some website where it literally says on the vial not for human consumption because they wanna save a couple of dollars. I don't get it, I don't think you should do that. That is not best practices, that is dangerous and you could inadvertently poison yourself. The next best practice, if you're doing this for weight loss, do what they did in the New England Journal of Medicine and do it in conjunction with exercise and nutritional intervention. So don't just take the shot and continue to eat McDonald's and drink wine, take the shot and use it as part of a lifestyle change if you're using it for weight loss. So there's not a whole bunch I can tell you about this topic because honestly, it's not even in circulation and FDA approved yet, but I can say that you should start low and go slow. You should work with a qualified medical professional that has some experience here and can get it from a reputable pharmacy. Don't buy it on the, on the dark web and then use it as part of a total lifestyle intervention. If you do those things, I think that's the best that you can do as of right now. And again, all of this can change in phase three clinical trials. So look guys, if you learned something, do me a favor like the video. If you're interested in content like this, don't forget to subscribe. If you're interested in becoming a patient and receiving Redditrutide and you qualify for it, feel free to reach out to us. Our website is all over the internet now, but just in case, I'll put it down below and we'll put it on the screen right here. Steel Health and Hormone Center, center spelled R-E, dot com. Fill out a contact form. We'll be in touch within 24 hours. Look, semaglutide is now gonna be harder to get since it's pulled off the shortage list. Terzepatide, same thing, pulled off the shortage list. Retitrutide, we may have a good run with this until the FDA approves it and then Eli Lilly shuts us down. So if you're interested, again, fill out a contact form. We'll be in touch within 24 hours. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.